The Coming of the Huns In the middle of the fourth century, the state of Christian religion was a scandal and a disgrace. Patient, humble, and long-suffering in adversity, it had become positive, aggressive, and unreasonable with success. Paganism was not yet dead, but it was rapidly sinking, finding its most faithful supporters among the conservative aristocrats of the best families on the one hand and among those benighted villagers on the other who gave their name to the expiring creed. Between these two extremes, the great majority of reasonable men had turned from the conception of many gods to that of one, and had rejected forever the beliefs of their forefathers. But with the vices of polytheism, they had also abandoned its virtues, among which toleration and religious good humour had been conspicuous. The strenuous earnestness of the Christians had compelled them to examine and define every point of their own theology. But as they had no central authority by which such definitions could be checked, it was not long before a hundred heresies had put forward their rival views, while the same earnestness of conviction led the stronger bands of schismatics to endeavour, for conscience' sake, to force their views upon the weaker, and thus to cover the Eastern world with confusion and strife. Alexandria, Antioch, and Constantinople were centres of theological warfare. The whole of North Africa, too, was rent by the strife of the Donatists, who upheld their particular schism by iron flails, and the war cry of, Praise to the Lord! but minor local controversies sank to nothing when compared with the huge argument of the Catholic and the Arian, which rent every village in twain and divided every household from the cottage to the palace. The rival doctrines of the Homoousian and of the Homoousian, containing metaphysical differences so attenuated that they could hardly be stated, turned bishop against bishop and congregation against congregation. The ink of the theologians and the blood of the fanatics were spilled in floods on either side, and gentle followers of Christ were horrified to find that their faith was responsible for such a state of riot and bloodshed as had never yet disgraced the religious history of the world. Many of the more earnest among them shocked and scandalised, slipped away to the Libyan desert or to the solitude of Pontus, there to await in self-denial and prayer that second coming which was supposed to be at hand. Even in the deserts they could not escape the echo of the distant strife, and the hermits themselves scowled fiercely from their dens at passing travellers who might be contaminated by the doctrines of Athanasius or of Arius. Such a hermit was Simon Melas, of whom I write. A Trinitarian and a Catholic, he was shocked by the excesses of the persecution of the Arians, which could be only matched by the similar outrages with which these same Arians, in the day of their power, avenged their treatment on their brother Christians. Weary of the whole strife, and convinced that the end of the world was indeed at hand, he left his home in Constantinople and travelled as far as the Gothic settlements in Dacia, beyond the Danube, in search of some spot where he might be free from the never-ending disputes. Still journeying to the north and east, he crossed the river which we now call the Dniester, and there, finding a rocky hill rising from an immense plain, he formed a cell near its summit. 
and settled himself down to end his life in self-denial and meditation. There were fish in the stream. The country teemed with game, and there was an abundance of wild fruits, so that his spiritual exercises were not unduly interrupted by the search of sustenance for his mortal frame. In this distant retreat he expected to find absolute solitude, but the hope was in vain. Within a week of his arrival, in an hour of worldly curiosity, he explored the edges of the high rocky hill upon which he lived, making his way up to a cleft, which was hung with olives and myrtles, he came upon a cave, in the opening of which sat an aged man, white-bearded, white-haired, and infirm, a hermit like himself. So long had this stranger been alone that he had almost forgotten the use of his tongue, but at last, words coming more freely, he was able to convey the information that his name was Paul of Nicopolis, that he was a Greek citizen, and that he also had come out into the desert for the saving of his soul, and to escape from the contamination of heresy. Little I thought, Brother Simon, said he, that I should ever find anyone else who had come so far upon the same holy errand. In all these years, and they are so many that I have lost count of them, I have never seen a man, save indeed one or two wandering shepherds, far out upon yonder plain. From where they sat the huge steppe, covered with waving grass and gleaming with a vivid green in the sun, stretched away as level and as unbroken as the sea to the eastern horizon, Simon Melas stared across it with curiosity. "'Tell me, Brother Paul,' said he, "'you who have lived here so long, "'what lies at the further side of that plain?' The old man shook his head. "'There is no further side to the plain,' said he. "'It is the earth's boundary, "'and stretches away to eternity.' For all these years I have sat beside it, and never once have I seen anything come across it. It is manifest that if there had been a further side, there would certainly at some time have come some traveller from that direction. Over the great river yonder is the Roman post of Tiras, but that is a long day's journey from here and they have never disturbed my meditations. On what do you meditate, Brother Paul? At first I meditated on many sacred mysteries, but now, for twenty years, I have brooded continually on the nature of the Logos. What is your view upon that vital matter, Brother Simon? Surely, said the younger man, there can be no question as to that. The Logos is assuredly but a name used by St. John to signify the deity. The old hermit gave a hoarse cry of fury, and his brown, withered face was convulsed with anger. Seizing the huge cudgel which he kept to beat off the wolves, he shook it murderously at his companion. Out with you! Out of my cell! he cried. Have I lived here so long to have it polluted by a vile Trinitarian, a follower of the rascal Athanasius? Wretched idolater, learn once for all that the Logos is in truth an emanation from the deity, and in no sense equal or co-eternal with him. Out with you, I say, or I will dash out your brains with my staff. It was useless to reason with the furious Arian, and Simon withdrew in sadness and wonder that at this extreme verge of the known earth 
the spirit of religious strife should still break upon the peaceful solitude of the wilderness. With hanging head and heavy heart, he made his way down the valley and climbed up once more to his own cell, which lay at the crown of the hill, with the intention of never again exchanging visits with his Aryan neighbour. Here, for a year, dwelt Simon Melas, leading a life of solitude and prayer. There was no reason why anyone should ever come to this outermost point of human habitation. Once a young Roman officer, Caius Crassus, rode out a day's journey from Tiras and climbed the hill to have speech with the anchorite. He was of an equestrian family and still held his belief in the old dispensation. He looked with interest and surprise, but also with some disgust at the ascetic arrangements of that humble abode. "'Whom do you please by living in such a fashion?' he asked. "'We show that our spirit is superior to our flesh,' Simon answered. "'If we fare badly in this world, we believe that we shall reap an advantage in the world to come.' The centurion shrugged his shoulders. "'There are philosophers among our people, Stoics and others, who have the same idea. When I was in the Herulean cohort of the Fourth Legion, we were quartered in Rome itself, and I saw much of the Christians, but I could never learn anything from them which I had not heard from my own father, whom you in your arrogance would call a pagan. It is true that we talk of numerous gods, but for many years we have not taken them very seriously. Our thoughts upon virtue and duty and a noble life are the same as your own. Simon Melas shook his head. If you have not the holy books, said he, then what guide have you to direct your steps? If you will read our philosophers, and above all the divine Plato, you will find that there are other guides who may take you to the same end. Have you by chance read the book which was written by our emperor, Marcus Aurelius? Do you not discover there every virtue which man could have, although he knew nothing of your creed? Have you considered also the words and actions of our late Emperor Julian, with whom I served my first campaign, when he went out against the Persians? Where could you find a more perfect man than he? Such talk is unprofitable, and I will have no more of it said Simon sternly. Take heed while there is time, and embrace the true faith, for the end of the world is at hand, and when it comes there will be no mercy for those who have shut their eyes to the light. So saying, he turned back once more to his praying stool and to his crucifix, while the young Roman walked in deep thought down the hill, and mounting his horse, rode off to his distant post. Simon watched him until his brazen helmet was but a bead of light on the western edge of the great plain. For this was the first human face that he had seen in all this long year, and there were times when his heart yearned for the voices and the faces of his kind. So another year passed, and save for the change of weather and the slow change of the seasons, one day was as another. Every morning when Simon opened his eyes, he saw the same grey line ripening into red in the furthest east, until the bright rim pushed itself above that far-off horizon across which no living creature had ever been known to come. Slowly the sun swept across the huge arch of the heavens, and as the shadows shifted from the black rocks which jutted upwards from above his cell, so did the hermit regulate his terms of prayer and meditation. There was nothing on earth to draw his eye or to distract his mind, for the grassy plain below was as void from month to month as the heaven above. So the long hours passed, 
until the red rim slipped down on the further side, and the day ended in the same pearl-grey shimmer with which it had begun. Once two ravens circled for some days round the lonely hill, and once a white fish-eagle came from the Denister and screamed above the hermit's head. Sometimes red dots were seen on the green plain where the antelopes grazed, and often a wolf howled in the darkness from the base of the rocks. Such was the uneventful life of Simon Melas the Anchorite, until there came the Day of Wrath. It was in the late spring of the year 375 that Simon came out from his cell, his gourd in his hand, to draw water from the spring. Darkness had closed in, the sun had set, but one last glimmer of rosy light rested upon a rocky peak, which jutted forth from the hill, on the further side from the hermit's dwelling. As Simon came forth from under his ledge, the gourd dropped from his hand, and he stood gazing in amazement. On the opposite peak a man was standing, his outline black in the fading light, he was a strange, almost a deformed figure, short-statured, round-backed, with a large head, no neck, and a long rod jutting out from between his shoulders. He stood with his face advanced and his body bent, peering very intently over the plain to the westward. In a moment he was gone, and the lonely black peak showed up hard and naked against the faint eastern glimmer. Then the night closed down, and all was black once more. Simon Melas stood long in bewilderment, wondering who this stranger could be. He had heard, as had every Christian, of those evil spirits which were wont to haunt the hermits in the Thebaid, and on the skirts of the Ethiopian waste. The strange shape of this solitary creature, its dark outline and prowling intent attitude, suggestive rather of a fierce, rapacious beast than of a man, all helped him to believe that he had at last encountered one of these wanderers from the pit, of whose existence in those days of robust faith he had no more doubt than of his own. Much of the night he spent in prayer, his eyes glancing continually at the low arch of his cell door, with its curtain of deep purple wrought with stars. At any instant some crouching monster, some horned abomination, might peer in upon him and he clung with frenzied appeal to his crucifix, as his human weakness quailed at the thought. But at last his fatigue overcame his fears, and falling upon his couch of dried grass, he slept until the bright daylight brought him to his senses. It was later than his wont, and the sun was far above the horizon, as he came forth from his cell, he looked across at the peak of rock, but it stood there, bare and silent. Already it seemed to him that that strange dark figure which had startled him so was some dream, some vision of the twilight. His gourd lay where it had fallen, and he picked it up with the intention of going to the spring but suddenly he was aware of something new. The whole air was throbbing with sound. From all sides it came, rumbling, indefinite, an inarticulate mutter, low but thick and strong, rising, falling, reverberating among the rocks, dying away into vague whispers, but always there. 
He looked round at the blue, cloudless sky in bewilderment. Then he scrambled up the rocky pinnacle above him, and sheltering himself in its shadow, he stared out over the plain. In his wildest dream, he had never imagined such a sight. The whole vast expanse was covered with horsemen, hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands, all riding slowly and in silence out of the unknown east. It was the multitudinous beat of their horses' hoofs which caused that low throbbing in his ears. Some were so close to him as he looked down upon them that he could clearly see their thin, wiry horses and the strange, humped figures of their swarthy riders sitting forward on the withers, shapeless bundles, their short legs hanging stirrupless, their bodies balanced as firmly as though they were part of the beast. In those nearest he could see the bow and the quiver, the long spear and the short sword, with the coiled lasso behind the rider, which told that this was no helpless horde of wanderers, but a formidable army upon the march. His eyes passed on from them and swept further and further, but still to the very horizon, which quivered with movement, there was no end to this monstrous cavalry. Already the vanguard was far past the island of rock upon which he dwelt, and he could now understand that in front of this vanguard were single scouts who guided the course of the army, and that it was one of these whom he had seen the evening before. All day, held spellbound by this wonderful sight, the hermit crouched in the shadow of the rocks, and all day the sea of horsemen rolled onward over the plain beneath. Simon had seen the swarming quays of Alexandria. He had watched the mob which blocked the Hippodrome of Constantinople. Yet never had he imagined such a multitude as now defiled beneath his eyes, coming from that eastern skyline which had been the end of his world. Sometimes the dense streams of horsemen were broken by droves of broodmares and foals, driven along by mounted guards. Sometimes there were herds of cattle. Sometimes there were lines of wagons with skin canopies above them. But then once more, after every break, came the horsemen. The horsemen. The hundreds and the thousands and the tens of thousands slowly, ceaselessly, silently drifting from the east to the west. The long day passed, the light waned, and the shadows fell. But still the great broad stream was flowing by. But the night brought a new and even stranger sight. Simon had marked bundles of faggots upon the backs of many of the led horses, and now he saw their use. All over the great plain, red pinpoints gleamed through the darkness, which grew and brightened into flickering columns of flame. So far as he could see, both to east and west, the fires extended, until they were but points of light in the furthest distance. White stars shone in the vast heavens above, red ones in the great plain below. And from every side rose the low, confused murmur of voices, with the lowing of oxen and the neighing of horses. Simon had been a soldier and a man of affairs before ever he forsook the world, and the meaning of all that he had seen was clear to him. History told him how the Roman world had ever been assailed by fresh swarms of barbarians coming from the outer darkness, and that the Eastern Empire had already, in its fifty years of existence since Constantine had moved the capital of the world 
to the shores of the Bosphorus, been tormented in the same way. Gepidae and Heruli, Ostrogoths and Sarmatians, he was familiar with them all. What the advanced sentinel of Europe had seen from this lonely, outlying hill was a fresh swarm breaking in upon the empire, distinguished only from the others by its enormous, incredible size and by the strange aspect of the warriors who composed it. He alone of all civilised men knew of the approach of this dreadful shadow, sweeping like a heavy storm cloud from the unknown depths of the east. He thought of the little Roman posts along the Dniester, of the ruined Dacian wall of Trajan behind them, and then of the scattered defenceless villages which lay with no thought of danger over all the open country which stretched down to the Danube. Could he but give them the alarm? Was it not perhaps for that very end that God had guided him to the wilderness? Then suddenly he remembered his Aryan neighbour, who dwelt in the cave beneath him. Once or twice during the last year he had caught a glimpse of his tall, bent figure hobbling round to examine the traps which he laid for quails and partridges. On one occasion they had met at the brook, but the old theologian waved him away as if he were a leper. What did he think now of this strange happening? Surely their differences might be forgotten at such a moment. He stole down the side of the hill, and made his way to his fellow hermit's cave. But there was a terrible silence as he approached it. His heart sank at that deadly stillness in the little valley. No glimmer of light came from the cleft in the rocks. He entered and called, but no answer came back. Then, with flint, steel, and the dry grass which he used for tinder, he struck a spark and blew it into a blaze. The old hermit, his white hair dabbled with crimson, lay sprawling across the floor. The broken crucifix, with which his head had been beaten in, lay in splinters across him. Simon had dropped on his knees beside him, straightening his contorted limbs and muttering the office for the dead. When the thud of a horse's hoofs was heard ascending the little valley which led to the hermit's cell, the dry grass had burned down, and Simon crouched, trembling in the darkness, pattering prayers to the Virgin that his strength might be upheld. It may have been that the newcomer had seen the gleam of the light, or it may have been that he had heard from his comrades of the old man whom they had murdered, and that his curiosity had led him to the spot. He stopped his horse outside the cave, and Simon, lurking in the shadows within, had a fair view of him in the moonlight. He slipped from his saddle, fastened the bridle to a root, and then stood peering through the opening of the cell. He was a very short, thick man, with a dark face, which was gashed with three cuts upon either side. His small eyes were sunk deep in his head, showing like black holes in the heavy, flat, hairless face. His legs were short and very bandy, so that he waddled uncouthly as he walked. Simon crouched in the darkest angle, and he gripped in his hand that same knotted cudgel which the dead theologian had once raised against him. As that hideous stooping head advanced into the darkness of the cell, he brought the staff down upon it with all the strength of his right arm, and then, as the stricken savage fell forward upon his face, he struck madly again and again, 
until the shapeless figure lay limp and still. One roof covered the first slain of Europe and of Asia. Simon's veins were throbbing and quivering with the unwonted joy of action. All the energy stored up in those years of repose came in a flood at this moment of need. Standing in the darkness of the cell, he saw, as in a map of fire, the outlines of the great barbaric host, the line of the river, the position of the settlements, the means by which they might be warned. Silently he waited in the shadow until the moon had sunk. Then he flung himself upon the dead man's horse, guided it down the gorge, and set forth at a gallop across the plain. There were fires on every side of him, but he kept clear of the rings of light. Round each he could see, as he passed, the circle of sleeping warriors with the long lines of picketed horses. Mile after mile and league after league stretched that huge encampment. And then, at last, he had reached the open plain which led to the river, and the fires of the invaders were but a dull smoulder against the black eastern sky. Ever faster and faster he sped across the steppe, like a single fluttered leaf which whirls before the storm. Even as the dawn whitened the sky behind him, it gleamed also upon the broad river in front, and he flogged his weary horse through the shallows until he plunged into its full yellow tide. So it was that, as the young Roman centurion Caius Crassus made his morning round, in the fort of Tiras, he saw a single horseman who rode towards him from the river. Weary and spent, drenched with water and caked with dirt and sweat, both horse and man were at the last stage of their endurance. With amazement the Roman watched their progress, and recognised in the ragged, swaying figure with flying hair and staring eyes, the hermit of the eastern desert. He ran to meet him, and caught him in his arms as he reeled from the saddle. "'What is it, then?' he asked. "'What is your news?' But the hermit could only point at the rising sun. "'To arms!' he croaked. "'To arms! The day of wrath is come!' And as he looked... The Roman saw, far across the river, a great dark shadow, which moved slowly over the distant plain. That is the end of The Coming of the Huns by Arthur Conan Doyle Read by Greg Wagland for Magpie Audio 2021